Hello, everybody. I hope you're ready to get um, into the topic of gastrointestinal disorders and discuss some of the common conditions we're going to see in the clinic setting, uh, both how to identify them as well as treat and manage these conditions, because it is something you're going to see on a relatively routine basis. Um, so a lot of the conditions we're going to talk about are very common, things that you're going to see daily, uh, but there are a few in here that I want you to know about that you might see less frequently. Uh, it's going to be issues that may be emergent that you need to get them out to a hospital for specialized care or referral to a specialist to manage the condition. So let's start right off with GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, you'll hear it called many things, acid reflux, indigestion, heartburn. It's a very, very common condition as we can see by how many medications are on the market for it now and are marketed towards the population. All it is is failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to have proper tone to control the contents of the stomach. Most of the time, this is due to obesity or overeating. Uh, they, could have, they could have been born with a sphincter that didn't have good tone or a poorly developed sphincter. Uh, there could be a, some genetic component to that if they've had a family history of it. So history taking is very important in this, especially you know, what the offending agent is, what's causing the reflux, if they notice it at specific times, and what kind of symptoms they're having. <clears throat> How long has it been going on? Have they tried anything to relieve the issue? Um, but typically the patient's gonna present to the clinic with the classic symptoms. They're gonna have ref reflux of an acid-like substance into their mouth, it'll burn, it'll taste bad, or into their throat. Um, they'll also have burping, They'll have worse pain when they're laying down. So when they, at night, they'll often wake up with um, either burping up contents or reflux into their mouth. Sometimes it'll take their breath, take them a while to, to get that swallow back down, drink some water, or drink something to get it calmed back down. Uh, a lot of patients also will have recurrent pharyngitis or cough that's worsened. Um, but some of the things that we really want to look for and ID in the clinic setting especially is when the person's starting to lose weight unexpectedly or when they're having trouble swallowing or any changes in voice or vomiting that's becoming more current. Um, remember when we talked back in the cardiovascular lecture about chest pain and how this can be confused with MI? It actually can, and it's very easy to confuse this with MI due to the severity of the pain that goes along with it and just the gnawing, dull chest pain that they can get. It also can radiate through to the shoulder or to the scapula region and it's very easy to confuse this with something else that we don't get a good history and a good background on what's going on. Um, it's also important to know what kind of medications the patients are on. Uh, if they've any history of bleeding or hemorrhaging, uh, any of this would be vital for us to know. Typically we're not going to use diagnostics until we've had failure of treatment or this has been a long-term condition that's recurrent with the patient. Um, Typically, it's going to be diagnosed in the office, and we're going to begin treatment with uh, typically lifestyle changes, which we'll get into in just a minute. When we do start to get into the diagnostics that we're going to use on the patient, normally it's going to be it's going to consist of uh, endoscopies. It's going to be H. pylori testing. Uh, when we get into esophageal pH testing and manometry, that's something that's going to be a, a specialist. Uh, category they're going to have to be sent out for that and typically when we get to that point we've already made the referral because we're unable to manage it with our treatment. As we get into management of this condition as a patient becomes either an acute onset that we've been trying to treat or it's a chronic patient who we're trying to modify things to get them to have a healthier lifestyle of course we want diet and weight loss to be our key if they're a smoker they need smoking cessation education uh, we want to avoid any offending food, foods, so anything that's uh, caffeine, chocolate, spicy food, NSAIDs, especially if they're going to eat anytime after 7 or 8 p.m. So if they're going to be laying down while a meal is still in their stomach, that's going to be key to stopping this. <clears throat> also, we want to tell the patient to elevate the head of bed. We want to get it over six inches, so anything above six inches will help to alleviate some of the symptoms until we can get it controlled. Um, and typically we want to start up, we start with step up therapy when we start treatment with medication. So we're going to start with a histamine 2 receptor agonist, a histamine 2 blocker. 
And typically things like Pepsid, Zantac, Tagamet, those are going to be your first line medications that we'll try. Um, all it does is decrease the amount of acids being secreted in the stomach. So we're trying to reduce the acid content. Uh, a lot of patients will come in, they've already tried these, they've already tried antacids, and some will have already tried PPIs. Um, but the key with PPIs is we have to educate the patient that it may take two weeks for those to fully take effect. Uh, and we always want to continue our therapy for at least eight weeks. I like to do mine for at least eight, eight to 10, because typically the patient <clears throat> that's first starting out with this, they're going to be kind of hesitant, especially with the lifestyle changes they have going on. Uh, and it may take longer to get a consistent therapy that, that controls the problem. Anytime you can use Caraphate, um, I reserve that for a patient who is either pregnant or has sustained issues with ulcerations in the stomach, so recurrent chronic ulcers in the stomach or bleeding in the stomach, because that helps to coat the stomach and to coat the uh, esophagus so it's not causing as much of a problem for the patient. The only problem with caraphate, when you use caraphate, it coats that stomach and coats that lining so the patient's not going to absorb other medications. So you need at least two to four hours in between other medications and using caraphate. And when they're taking caraphate four times a day, that doesn't leave a lot of time for other medications to be absorbed. So you have to really be selective when you're using that with a patient. Uh, if the patient has a very severe GERD, so they have symptoms that constant throughout the day or any time they eat, um, then you want to do a step down therapy. So I'll start with a PPI. And if it's controlled well with a PPI and they've done well for eight weeks, then I'll step down to, to a, a histamine blocker. Um, if they're controlled with a histamine blocker and they're continuing their lifestyle modifications, then we may try something else. So typically you can get control with a PPI and the patient will be <laughs> very appreciative of this because this really takes control of their life and what they can do and what they can eat. But as with most patients with GERD, they really need to be taking control of what they're eating and exercising as well anyway, because that's what's led to the problem. Uh, this is just a, a graph for medical management of reflux. So you guys can look over this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The main part of it is um, how we're going to diagnose it, how you're going to see it in the clinic, how often they're having it, uh, is it a recurrence of an episode? Have they had it in the past? Have they had H. pylori in the past? All these things are going to be important on deciding which way we need to go to treat GERD. <clears throat> so when we get into our first line PPIs, like we talked about with patients that have frequent or, or severe GERD, um, your first lines are going to be imeprazole, lansoprazole. You know, the common ones that they can get over the counter now, typically they're going to want a prescription for this though, because sometimes it'll be completely covered by their insurance or it'll be cheaper on their insurance than it will be over the counter. Um, so PPIs are very commonly prescribed and they work very well. Uh, there's a lot of debate and a lot of scuttlebutt over PPIs being linked to Alzheimer's now. Um, there's no definitive clinical research that shows that. And like I said in previous lectures, you know, you, you just have to weigh the risk and benefit with the patient. <clears throat> also, you can get into surgical management and we're not going to be a part of that. We may be uh, the referral agent for that. So we'll send them out to a specialist to have them evaluated if it's that severe or if they have a genetic uh, malformation of the sphincter that needs surgical management. Um, a lot of times you'll see reflux with folks who have had a lap band procedure or they've had a uh, bypass, a gastric bypass, but that's something that will need to be handed, handled by their surgeon because they only have certain medications that they can take with those procedures. <clears throat> Anytime in pregnancy and lactation, you wanna avoid antacids. Um, and remember I said, we wanna give pregnant patients sulcrophate or caraphate when we can. Zantac is safe, so they can take it as well. Um, and they can take PPIs prior to lactation, so they can't take it with lactation because it can go through to the infant. Now, as we talk about GERD, you get into something called peptic ulcer disease. Uh, this is very common as well, and this is people who've had long-standing reflux and it's gotten to the point of ulceration in the gastric lining. Um, most often, it's due to H. pylori um, and NSAID use. Um, more often now, we're seeing more NSAID use caused 
uh, peptic ulcer disease and we're seeing helicobacter he's a, he's a pylori because more people are on NSAIDs now. Um, you see a lot of this in over the road truck drivers, uh, people who have jobs where they may not eat or exercise properly uh, or may have a sedentary lifestyle. And now that you can get a lot of these medications over the counter, patients are treating the reflux, but they're really not treating it completely. So they're not em employing the lifestyle modifications that they need to take care of the issue at hand. Uh, typically, they're going to complain of epigastric pain. They'll be able to pinpoint that pain, and typically it's right over the area where the ulceration is. It'll be very tender, and they'll have the same type of symptoms they will with reflux. Um, of course, we want to get them referred out when we do think they have peptic ulcer disease. And if they have H. pylori, uh, it needs to be eradicated. So there are very simple ways to test for H. pylori now. And typically what we do is a urea breath test. You can do that in a clinic now. It's very easy. You have the patient drink a sucrose serum. You do a, you do a breath test first to get their baseline. Then you have them drink a sucrose serum and sit and rest for a few minutes after they've drank that solution and sat for a while. Then you have them breathe in another bag. You take the control bag from the beginning. Then you take the one after they've drank the solution and you send it out to the lab. Basically what it does is it causes the bacteria in the stomach, uh, the H. pylori bacteria, to excrete urea. And if it's elevated, that's when you get a positive reaction. Uh, you can do the antibody testing, but if the patient's had H. pylori before, of course, it's always going to be positive because your body, body recognizes that invader. So it may not be as effective as the urea breath test. I always like the urea breath test. Fecal antigen, again, it's collection. Uh, the patient's often not compliant with collection or doesn't want to do it. So urea breath test is really your best route. The recommended therapy is triple therapy with a proton pump inhibitor. inhibitor. Um, and typically, I'll put patients on um, clarithromycin and metronidazole and flagyl. Sometimes I use amoxicillin, but a lot of folks are allergic to penicillins or amoxicillin in general. So usually I'll go with flagyl, but remember, anytime you put a patient on flagyl, you need to tell them to avoid alcohol, to avoid the um, vomiting that will occur with it. There are several different routes for treatment of um, H. pylori eradication. Now often we're seeing more resistance uh, because people have halfway treated over the counter now for H. pylori and kind of controlled the symptoms but really never treated the true bacteria in their stomach or they've only taken partial doses of their medication. And another important part of this is this is going to be a 7 to 14 day treatment cycle. So the patient's going to be taking this medication for a while, and they're going to be taking it several times a day. So if we're using or if we're treating a patient who has a resistant strain, you're seeing quadruple therapy more often now. And they'll get a PPI, they'll get a bismuth uh, treatment, they'll get flagyl and tetracycline for seven to fourteen days. And typically, this these will be these will all be two times a day. So it'll be BID dosing, and with the bismuth, it'll be four times. So they're taking several medications several times a day for up to a 14 day cycle. I like to do mine 10 to 14 days because typically seven days isn't gonna fully eradicate the bacteria. So we like to get in and treat this as well as we can and eradicate it as quickly as possible. Because if we don't, then you get into issues of resistance, um, even to the quadruple therapy. And we're searching for other medications that may be able to control the agent. Let's move into gallbladder disorders. Um, when you think about gallbladder disorders, most people think about stones or sludge in the gallbladder that's producing an obstruction. And typically that's the cause. Um, but you've, just like we learned in nursing, the six Fs, cholecystitis, fat, 40 fertile, flatulent female, and fat intolerant. These are the, this is kind of your characteristics for the common um, cholecystitis patient. Now, these patients should be easily identified. They should have Murphy, positive Murphy sign. Their pain levels, depending on the patient's tolerance, may run anywhere from a 6 to a 10. Some people can tolerate it well. It's not that bad. They just have some sludge buildup. It comes and goes. Uh, so they may, buy, may not be hurting that bad, but it's always radiation to the right shoulder, a positive Murphy sign. They can kind of pinpoint that location where it hurts. They may have some reflux-like symptoms. Uh, when it gets more advanced or if there's uh, possible obstruction leading to some inflammation around the gallbladder, they may run fever. Um, and 
more severe cases may have some jaundice. Usually if a patient has gallbladder disorder or um, cholecystitis, they'll have a high fatty diet. So always get that in your history. Find out what kind of diet they've been on. Um, diagnostics with this, we always want to check the AST and ALT, of course. Um, the alkaline phosphate is going to be two to four times higher for a positive on the cholecystitis. Elevated bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase can indicate a stone, although that's not 100%. It could be elevated for other reasons. Alkaline phosphatase elevates for a lot of different reasons in patients. It could be medication. It could just be an elevated norm for that patient. So it's always good to have a baseline if they're a, a long-term patient. And then we want to get an ultrasound or a HIDA scan on this to verify that that is what's going on, that there are stones, that there's a blockage, some sort of dysfunction in the gallbladder. When we get into management of this condition, of course, it's typically going to be hospitalization and treatment either surgically, um, and most are done by uh, lap laparoscopy now, so they'll do them less invasive. It's not open as much as it used to be. Um, but you will see cases that are more involved that they have to open and there's higher risk with those patients. A lot of patients will get tored off for pain because it does help dilate some of those vessels and open up the, the, um, open up the access for the sludge to kind of get out if there is sludge or stones. Sometimes you can use some solutions that the patients will have instilled that can dissolve some of the stones, but typically that's going to be managed by a specialist. I also like to give these patients Zofran uh, if they do present to the office with this. Um, if we have Zofran available, um, I'll typically give them 60, IM, 60 milligrams IM in the office of Tordol just to kind of ease the pain for a while. Um, and there are some cleanse diets you can see out there uh, for people who have recurrent stones that do help the gallbladder stay kind of cleared out. Um, and especially patients who are stone producers, they will, they will have a gen genetic component for some people who do produce more stones or have smaller biliary tracts that get obstructed easily. If they have long-term um, elevated bilirubin due to these kind of conditions or anything that's blocking up the gallbladder, they can lead to chronic pancreatitis or hepatic abscess. So that's something we want to keep in the back of our mind. Celiac disease, this is, and everybody's going to these gluten-free diets now. Uh, celiac disease isn't as frequent as you would think with all the diets for gluten-free now. Uh, you can see the link we've provided here to give the patient that is truly uh, gluten sensitive um, or gluten allergic a di some diet options in the office. And they have some good printouts and handouts for the patients that you can provide for them. Typically, this patient is going to present younger in age because it's going to be something that's going to be a true allergy or sensitivity caused by gluten. And when they start eating normal foods, they're going to notice this abdominal bloating. They're just not thriving as they should. They're not gaining weight like they should because their body's not absorbing the contents that they're consuming. So if they're gluten insensitive, a lot of the things that we're transporting through our gastric membranes aren't being transported. They're just being evacuated from the bowels. <clears throat> A gluten-free diet can be good for some people, but I try to caution my patients on this. You can eat a healthy diet without going gluten-free, um, but some people, that's their prerogative. They want to try gluten-free, and I always just tell them to manage their vitamins and minerals um, as they need to with this because they're going to miss a lot of things if they go to straight gluten-free. Let's go over some of the common liver enzymes that we're going to look at in the clinic setting and test most often when we think there's some kind of abdominal disorder going on. So AST, a lot of these are going to be very key on the liver especially. AST and LT. So you look at an AST when you think about inflammation or necrosis in the liver um, and that could be caused from anything from cirrhosis to hepatitis to medications they're taking causing the liver to not function as well or getting clogged up trying to process so many medications, especially those patients who have other medical conditions that may be on numerous medications. We've all seen the ones in clinic that they're taking 10 or 15 different medications. We gotta think all of those are being processed by the liver. So it's putting real, a real strain on the liver and it can lead to some dysfunction. Uh, also, you'll see uh, fatty liver disease is very common now. 
because of our diet and our lifestyle, if they're not eating appropriately, if they're not exercising, we end up with fatty liver disease, which causes the liver not to function as well. And you'll see the AST and ALT rise. Um, alkaline phosphatase, I don't focus on it as much anymore because you will see this number bounce all over the place in patients, especially ones that do have other medical conditions or on medications. Uh, alkaline phosphatase is really good if you're going to use it in sequence with something. So if you're if you're taking it over time with other lab values, that's when it becomes more apparent that it may be a true elevation. And then a, GD, a GGTP is also another common uh, test we're going to perform, often not in the clinic. That will usually be in a specialty setting, unless we have a chronic hepatitis or cirrhosis patient that we're managing. So when we get into liver dysfunction, we get a mild dysfunction with AST elevations greater than five times the upper limits. You think alcohol, uh, thyroid disease can cause this. Um, also excessive exercise. So when you look at excessive exercise, you get that lactic acid buildup and you'll have patients who will have, um, their urine will have blood in it or have clots in it. That's, that's what all this is from because the body's trying to process all that lactic acid and get it out of the system and it will cause your AST to elevate. Uh, typically, if you look at your ALT as compared to this and it's elevated, then you wanna think non-alcoholic fatty liver. So they've got a fatty liver for some other reason. What's going on? Is it a hepatitis? Uh, is it the medication they're taking? Is it toxins that may have been introduced that they're unaware of? Is it some kind of pesticide or herbicide they've been um, around that's got into their body? Is it something they've inhaled that their liver just can't handle? Uh, so if we're trying to get more specific on what the offending agent is, that's when we'll look at our ALT. Um, if we get into 15 times the upper limits of AST or ALT, that's going to be somebody who I'm typically going to refer to the ER uh, or to a specialist for management because that's when we're getting into possible uh, damage to the liver that can't be reversed. Um, so you think a patient that's OD'd on medications, um, viral hepatitis, acute viral hepatitis, you'll see often. And sometimes you will see patients that we're changing antidepressants on and their AST and ALT will elevate just extremely high for the reason of the medications causing that problem. So we'll have to stop that medication, get them on something different. Uh, if they're not having any, any other symptoms with the medication, if they're not having any other side effects, um, it may not be as apparent. So it's always important when you're changing medications or putting a patient on a new medication, especially antidepressants, to check a liver function. Uh, I always like to check mine at least a week or two after the patient started it just to see if it's having any effect on their liver. Uh, also, I like to tell my patients to be careful with herbal supplements they may be taking, medications they may be taking over the counter, uh, if they're on recreational drugs, if they utilize recreational drugs. Uh, we always wanna tell them to be cautious with this because it can lead to other problems. Um, also, when you're thinking about your AST elevations, you can also have elevations from ACE inhibitors they may be on for hypertension, or statins they may be on for lipids. Uh, cephalosporins can cause elevations in that. NSAIDs can cause elevations in that. Um, you don't see a lot of people on tetracycline anymore, so don't look for it as much. Uh, if a patient's on iron, it can also cause AST elevations, thiazide diuretics benzos and heparin. They can all call it, cause AST elevations. Um, when you think about ALT, they can all be caused by the same medications I just listed, but they'll be to a lesser extent. Uh, when you're looking at ALT, you're thinking, you know, something acutely is going on. They have mono. Is it viral hepatitis? Is it ALL? Uh, what's going on with the patient? What else is going on outside of what medications they're taking? So um, if you're looking for specialized markers for cholestasis, so, so you look at a liver that's just not functioning properly, uh, you look at elevations over time. So you wanna look at their liver enzymes over time. How are they functioning? What's going on? Um, is the patient actually causing this by something they're doing? Or is this just a chronic process that's occurring due to genetic, genetic issues, family history? Um, or is it a disease process that's underlying? They could also have bone disease. Um, any kind of cancers can cause elevated alkaline phosphatase, but normal GGPs, which 
that's going to be less frequent. Typically you're going to see that happen and they're going to find that out in oncology practices. Um, but it might be something you pick up on the side with one of your patients that you've really had trouble figuring out what actually is going on with that patient. Uh, you'll also see GT, GGTP elevation. Sorry, it's a tongue twister. Um, you'll see those elevations with gr growth spurts in kids. So when they do have a growth spurt, you may see a high AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, GGTP. All these things may elevate just due to growth spurt and the liver trying to process all these things that are, that are changing in their body. If a patient has an isolated elevation of a GGTP, okay, that's when you want to think acute pancreatic process going on. So they have pancreatitis, heart attack, which I hope they present with other issues other than just an elevated GGTP. And why are you testing that by itself? So really that GGTP can be something that's utilized more in a specialty practice or in a hospital setting rather than a clinic because we're going to have to send it out, wait on it. And if they're having symptoms of MI, um, for pancreatic disease, that should be an acute process. Now you may pick this up with somebody who has long-term COPD, diabetes, or an alcoholic, um, but we should see other elevations as well, especially if they're an alcoholic. As you can see with the acronyms below, these are some of the things that we think about when we look at ALT and AST. So alcohol, statins, and Tylenol, of course, we've heard that all the way through nursing school, and Avandia, liver infection, or top toxic or therapeutic agents for ALT. And I gave a list of some of those on the previous slide. Um, so let's move into cirrhosis. Um, when we think of cirrhosis, a lot of us may think uh, alcohol, which is a large contributor to cirrhosis in our population, uh, but also drug use, infection, and viruses. Viruses are a big one. We're seeing more viruses cause cirrhosis, especially vir viral diseases that are um, lasting over a long time in patients. So things like HIV may lead to cirrhosis um, or other viral syndromes that may be long lasting. When you think of cirrhosis also, that patient presenting, typically they're gonna have um, abnormal bruising throughout their body. A lot of times you'll see it over the abdomen, uh, but sometimes it'll be in the periphery in their extremities. Um, you'll also have them vomiting blood sometimes, um, which that should be a direct indicator that something serious is going on. Uh, they also may present with jaundice, which we'll get into a little later, which is yellow on the skin. You guys know that. And when you palpate the liver or the area of the liver, it'll be painful. Um, or you may get a positive Murphy sign just from the extent of the inflammation around the liver. And if you palpate the borders uh, and percuss the liver, it may be enlarged. But obviously, we're, we're going to want verification of that through imaging. Uh, and it may be very nodular. Uh, typically, I'll send patients out for an ultrasound of the liver if I think there's a process going on, and they can usually give you a pretty good gauge on what's happening with the liver. Is it fatty liver disease? Is it nodular? What's happening? It can kind of give you some insight into what's going on. Some other things you might pick up on, especially those that have alcohol problems, will be spider angiomas on the face. That's a big one. So if they have spider angiomas on the face, that's a key for you to look into their history to see if they have alcohol issues in the past. Also a deuterans contracture, that's a common contracture you'll see in folks that have cirrhosis. Um, it'll be, it looks kind of like trigger finger. So their finger will pull up, but it's due to the deuterans contracture in their hand. So the fascia that lays over the tendon has a nodule on it, which is contracting that finger. Uh, if, we're, if we're wanting to assess for cirrhosis in the clinic setting, we want to check the CBC, albumin, bilirubin, and ferritin, of course. Um, Antimitochondrial antibodies are expensive and they take a long time to test. So typically I won't run those. Uh, that'll be run by specialty. And then, like I said, ultrasound to check the size, what's going on, how's circulation, and a CT if we're thinking there may be a tumor. Typically I'll do a CT after I perform an ultrasound on the patient. If it's also the difference between chronic and acute cirrhosis, if it's chronic cirrhosis, you'll see the ALT greater than S the AST two times unless it's because of alcohol. So any other issue that the patient has that's causing cirrhosis, if it's chronic, the ALT will be greater than the AST times two.
And these are just some of the classifications. Uh, you guys can look over that. There's nothing really to go through on this. Uh, of course, you want when you manage these patients, you want to look for um, anything that we can do to stop the damage that's going on to the liver. So stop drinking, improve their diet, vitamin replacement for those that aren't absorbing things well or haven't been, especially those that have been drinking. You want to think B12. Um, we want to monitor for ascites in the stomach and encephalopathy, any of the symptoms that may go along with encephalopathy. So changes in um, consciousness, changing, changes in function of the brain, the speech patterns, uh, memory, we want to watch for those. If a patient has high seroammonia levels and they get lactulose, typically that's going to be done in the hospital. We're not going to be seeing that in the clinic. Unless you're in a specialty GI practice, you may be uh, adding lactulose to somebody's regimen, but typically you're not going to do that in primary care. And as I talked about earlier, that's a deuterans contracture. You can see the nodule there just below the fascia and the fingers, and it will pull that back. Now, there are things they can do to release that with the fascial injections, um, but we want to really get the, the source of the issue under control before we start addressing that. And we talked about jaundice on a previous slide that may present with cirrhosis. I always remember, people think someone has jaundice. You don't have jaundice. This is a symptom. Um, it's like someone has a cough. Uh, it, no, this is a symptom. This is an underlying process that's going on in the body. It's a buildup of that bile pigment in the skin. So I always tell them this is just a symptom of something else that's going on. We need to treat what's going on to get rid of the jaundice. All right, so let's move into hepatitis. Um, there are a lot of causes for hepatitis as well. And as you can see with A, B, C, D, E, and G classifications, there are a lot of different types of hepatitis. Typically, we think about A, B, and C, um, with A, B, and C being the most common. I believe now there are some more categories they're adding on. I think there's an H and an I they've added. Uh, and I want to say there may be an L, but there's several that they've added in. It's just different variations of the same thing. So. There are no tests available for ENG right now, but typically, as you'll see in these slides as we go through, some of the B and E and some of the other ones are linked together. It's just mutated forms. So when you think about hepatitis A, it's an acute illness, uh, and it's typically due to a fecal oral route. Um, they'll have a positive IgM antibody and a hepatitis A virus. So when a patient has hepatitis A, it's usually self-limiting, it'll go away. Um, hepatitis B, um, it's probably one of the more common ones you might see in clinic, uh, but hepatitis C by far is the most common. And it is chronic, 70 to 85% in our um, ACV infected persons. And this is a long term process. Um, there are some things now that um, will help the patient resolve hepatitis C and maybe cure it, um, but they are expensive even though some insurance is starting to cover those treatments. Um, there are some CDC handouts that I have in the materials portion of the course um, that you can look over. They'll give you, give you some more ideas of, of the classifications of the hepatitis. And it also has a rundown of the different classifications and types. Um, but like I said before, B and C, C is the more likely chronic. A and B are most likely going to be acute and go away quickly and be treated relatively easily. Hepatitis A, basically, it just needs to get out of their system. They've ingested some fecal matter. Typically, you see this a lot in restaurant and daycare facilities where people don't wash their hands properly and they end up ingesting some fecal matter. So it's self-limiting illness, typically, unless they uh, have a, a compromised immune status. Hepatitis D, like I said, B and D, B and E, some of these are linked together. So hepatitis, it, hepatitis D only occurs in the presence of hepatitis B. So if we're treating a patient for hepatitis B, and typically it's going to be somebody who has hepatitis B chronically, then they might uh, find hepatitis D as they're being evaluated by a specialist. Uh, hepatitis E, it's only diagnosed by antibodies to hepatitis E or HEV RNA. Typically, you're not going to see this. This is going to be specialty only, and they're going to identify in a specialist's office. Like I said earlier, there are some treatments for hepatitis C now. You think of Harvoni, 
Um, and at Clusa, you see advertisers for these on TV all the time. Um, they also have Vicara Pack, which is a triple triple therapy. So we're really trying to team up on uh, hepatitis with the medications and combine something that's really going to eradicate it so the patient can have a better quality of life and not have damage to the liver. Um, because, I mean, the liver can heal a lot of its issues by itself. I mean, we can remove part of the liver and it'll grow back to some extent. But anytime we can reduce that chronic damage that's being performed on the liver, the more likely the patient is, is to recover fully. All right, so let's move into pancreatitis. Uh, most often this is an acute illness that you're gonna see and it's gonna be something you're gonna refer out. Um, it can be caused by a lot of different things as well, gallstones, toxins, alcohol. Uh, most of the time it's gonna be due to stones um, and, the over, and the surrounding inflammation from that issue. But it can be from a lot of different problems, as we'll see as we go through this. Um, most of the patients who present with this, they're going to have very severe abdominal pain. And usually they come in relatively quick because it's going to be a waxing and waning pain. I mean, it, these patients are doubled over. Uh, they're in obvious pain. They're sweating. Uh, they're clammy. And they may be running a fever. I mean, they do not feel well. Uh, a lot of the patients that come in, they will come in in a wheelchair or be wheeled in in a wheelchair because they just are that discom that discomforted by it. Um, but if you're catching them in one of these waning periods, they may walk in and then while they're in the office, double over and go into this terrible pain. And typically, it's right over that epigastric area, the pancreas area. Um, and you won't even be able to palpate it because it'll be firm, it'll be rigid, they'll be guarding that area. And it can radiate back through to the back or the shoulder blade. Um, like I said, it's just an all-encompassing pain. It just hurts. Um, typically with these patients, check a serum, amylase, and lipase. Uh, that's your standard labs you're going to get on these patients. But like I said, we're not going to check these in the clinic because this is somebody you're going to identify and get them out the ER because they're going to need some kind of uh, monitoring to make sure that everything's okay and it's not advancing to a point where they're gonna need surgery. Uh, they may need a CT or an MRI, but that's gonna be dealt with at the ER. Um, most of the time, this is gonna be due to gallstones, like I said earlier, or alcohol use. Now, if somebody's an alcoholic, they're high likelihood to have pancreatitis, but 10 to 20% is gonna be idiopathic in nature. Uh, there is some investigation now that there are some viruses that may lead to pancreatitis. I think they said now it's like 7% of what they thought was idiopathic may be due to a virus. So there's just a lot of debate on what causes that or why pancreatitis occurs in some pa patients. And there's a large populace that we just don't know. Um, I've seen people treated with Cipro that had pancreatitis, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's just a lot of trial and error you'll see some physicians use, especially in the emergent setting of trying to get this under control. The main thing is getting the pain under control and hydrating the patient because they are not eating, they're not sleeping, they're not resting. All they're doing is hurting and either vomiting or having diarrhea. And a lot of these patients you'll see will be vomiting just recurrently throughout the day. Um, also, if you look in your text on page 705, there's also a long list of medications that can lead to pancreatitis as well. Over long-term use, typically it's not acute, but you'll see use long-term of these medications can cause pancreatitis. Like I said, management, supportive, pain management, fluids. Nutrition's a, a tricky one because really, if they're in acute, acute pancreatitis issue, you really don't want them eating, so they're gonna have to have IV nutrition. You're gonna be on a liquid diet until they're sure that your amylase and lipase are reducing, it's going back to normal, then they might uh, increase your diet to something more palatable. Uh, antibiotics, like I said, I've seen people try Cipro before. Um, there's some papers that says Cipro might be effective in eradicating or helping to resolve the issue. I'm not sure on the mechanism there. Maybe something with the gallbladder and gallstones and some of the back of the bile causing inflammation that may be leading to bacterial infection or possible abscess. I'm not sure, but sometimes Cipro is their go, or more often Cipro is their go-to when they're going to try an antibiotic for pancreatitis. And chronic management. If somebody ends up having chronic pancreatitis, of course, we think alcoholism. So we're going to try to get them into a program to stop their alcohol use and to avoid it. 
Also, they need to reduce the fat in their diet. And also, we're going to have a supplement of a pancreatic enzyme because there has been some damage to the pancreas and chronic pancreatitis often causes that. Then we need to get a, a replacement for that pancreatic enzyme they've lost. So this will be a supplement that they'll take the rest of their life. Also, we have to control the glucose because we know insulin production is performed in the pancreas. And if they don't have proper pancreas function, then they're not going to be able to control their glucose. So a lot of these patients will end up diabetic and be on either insulin or some form of medication that's going to help manage their glucose. Another antibiotic you'll see used sometimes is Permaxin, but I really don't see it as often as Cipro. Cipro is really the one that you'll see. Um, you can also do some off-label use of vitamin E supplementation for pa patients who have pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis. Uh, it'd be vitamin E, six to 800 milligrams daily. But like I always say, if you're gonna do an off-label use of a medication on a patient, especially a vitamin supplement, be careful. Um, because, you know, if anything goes wrong, that's on your license. So appendicitis, this should be just like pancreatitis, very obvious once the patients present. Um, you know, you're always going to look for that McBurney sign. Uh, I typically don't test the heel jar because the patient doesn't feel well enough to do a heel jar. Usually they're laying down, guarding. Um, they'll have the rebound tenderness. Sometimes you'll get Rovesing sign. I've seen that several times in the office where the pain's actually not over Bernie's points. It's on the other side. Um, it's just a pain receptor um, dysfunction due to the amount of inflammation around the appendix. Uh, when a patient presents with these symptoms and it normally, it, they will normally have that textbook pain in the area but it may not be the full blown presentation. I mean, the patient may walk in and just say, I've got this pain in my abdomen and kind of point to the area or when you do your test and you do that McBurney's or Iliopsoas test, they have a positive result. Then we may get them out to have them check for appendicitis. Um, I have seen people treated in the office for possible appendicitis before. I always like to get another opinion on this, send them out for an evaluation by a specialist. Normally, if I suspect appendicitis, I'm going to send them out um, for evaluation in the ER. They can do more tests there and get the results back quicker than we can in a clinic setting. Um, if we're going to check for appendicitis, though, and we're in a clinic setting that has um, labs that are returned relatively quickly, usually CBC with diff, CRP, and a urine HCG. Why don't we want to test the urine HCG? Make sure they're not pregnant um, because sometimes we can get pains um, from things like. Um, tubal bursts that can cause the same type of pain that appendicitis would. Also, rupture of top of pregnancy can cause those type issues, and it can mimic appendicitis. Uh, the ultimate solution to this surgical removal, we all know it's laparoscopic. They can remove it that way. It's very simple. It's quick surgery, and most often there's not any complications now unless there's underlying issues that we didn't know about. Small bowel obstruction. Um, Really, patients with small bowel obstruction are going to come in with this chronic cramping, vomiting. They just can't keep anything down because they have an obstruction. Things can't flow through their bowels like they should. Most often, they'll have a fever that accompanies all these symptoms. Uh, when you palpate that abdomen, it'll be re really rigid. Sometimes you can palpate the fecal mass that's blocking the area or whatever mass is blocking the area if it's a tumor. Um, they'll have uh, a very flat and firm abdomen so that rigidity you expect and as soon as I suspect something like this I, sometimes I'll get a KUB just to be sure uh, if I have the ability to do that in the office but typically I'm going to send them out to the ER because they need to have a referral to a surgeon to have the obstruction removed. Uh, you don't ever want to try to treat this with medication to get the bowels moving because it's an obstruction it's not going to move. Um, the likelihood that we're able to manipulate that obstruction, whether it be fecal or not, out of the way of the bowel for things to be flowing again is less likely than that patient having a perforation than us having a, a much larger problem to deal with. Peritonitis, um, it's not a very common thing you're going to see in the clinic unless you're in a GI setting. They're going to present with a lot of the same symptoms you see with um, a lot of the acute issues uh, we've talked about so far. So the guarding, fever, abdominal rigidity, stension, they're going to have all these 
Um, but most often you're going to catch something in the history of the background that has led to this condition. So there's something in the history that's telling you, okay, this may be peritonitis. Is it, is it something the patients had going on? Do they have access to the abdomen for some reason that a bacterial infection is present? So have they had a drain? Have they had some kind of procedure that has led to a bacterial infection? Um, or have they had appendicitis or do they have appendicitis that leads to this peritonitis? Uh, so the history in the background, what's been going on with that patient, doing a good visual and um, palpatory examination on the patient is going to be key in telling what's going on. Typically, if we're suspecting this, we're not going to get to the point of doing a CBC. Uh, we're going to go ahead and send them out to the ER because they need to be hospitalized and managed that way. The only way to treat this is IV antibiotics and management in the hospital. GI hemorrhage. So when we think bleeding in the GI tract, we go back to GERD, we go back to PUD. This is typically what we think of when we think of bleeding in the GI tract, and that's upper GI. So when we think upper GI bleeding, we think um, vomiting with streaky blood, two just blatant bright red blood. Um, and then if, it, if, if they have upper GI bleed and they're defecating, it's going to be dark or black. Um, so you think melana, you think hyperactive bowel signs, bowel sounds with the upper GI bleed. With a lower GI bleed, that's where you think more of the, the red blood in the stool. Um, also, a lower GI bleed may be something like an internal hemorrhoid that's ruptured. Uh, we'll get into that a little later. And you can see from the etiology, there's a lot of different reasons somebody can have a bleed, but typically we think with the upper GI, we think NSAIDs, we think H. pylori. Um, those are the most common things we see upper GI bleed, bleeds from. Uh, when we think lower GI bleeds, that's when we get into more chronic conditions, so diverticulitis, hemorrhoids, ulcerations, colitis, um, things that have happened over time that the patient may not have any control over. It may just be genetic. Um, so that's something we want to think about when we're trying to distinguish between the two. We always want to do a good cardiovascular exam to make sure the patient's compensating for, for the blood loss. Um, we also do, want to do a good abdominal exam to make sure there's nothing else going on abdominally that may be leading to this. Um, we always want to check the aorta especially to make sure there's not some kind of bleed there that they're compensating for, just a tiny leak that's leading to some abdominal distension. Um, that may confuse us with a hemorrhage, a GI hemorrhage. But typically you're gonna get in the history, the patient's gonna present and tell you these symptoms they've had and presentation of the melanoma, or the hematoemesis, or passage of blood in their stool, anything like that, that that can tell us what may be going on. Now, when we think about diagnostics for a GI bleed, CBC or radiographs, of course, we always wanna get those KUBs, um, but typically, if it's a bleed that's happened over time, we want to get a scope. We want to see what's going on. Let's get in there and see what's happening. Um, you can do the H. pylori testing like we talked about earlier, if that's what's suspected. There are a lot of reflux symptoms. Now we think it's progressed to the point of PUD. Uh, we can do some H. pylori testing. But the gold standard is going to be uh, colonoscopy or endoscopy and seeing what's going on. Uh, and to do that, we have to have a referral to a specialist and to get that conducted. Also, with those patients, if they're on NSAIDs, we want to stop those NSAIDs, tell them to avoid anything that may encourage bleeding, uh, increase their fluid intake, and try to manage or offset the loss they've had in their blood. Constipation. This is very common as well. Typically, constipation is not going to be the presenting sign. Those that typically present with constipation complaints are going to be the constipation complaints that aren't truly constipation. So one of the main things we need to tell our patients is what is normal for you? Um, when you start getting the elderly population, if they haven't gone every morning or every night, they think they're constipated. No, that's, that's not always the fact. It, it depends on what the patients eat, what their lifestyle's like, what medications are they on, what's normal for that patient. Then we can figure out if it's truly constipation or not. If they're having fewer than three stools per, per week and hard and lumpy stools, or they're straining on defecation, that may be an indication they may be constipated. So it's any constip any combination, <laughs> sorry, any constipation, any combination of the two out of the list that we have here um, 
can mean they have constipation. So if you have any of those two together, uh, there can be primary and secondary causes. I mean, we all know constipation can be for any different reason, uh, medication, diet, exercise, what's going on? Do they have a tumor? Do they have this? Do they have that? I mean, constipation is really just our body saying something's not happening in a normal circumstance as I'm used to. We can't process our food properly. I'm not getting enough fluid intake, uh, whatever that may be. So what's changed in the recent past for that patient that's led to this constipation? Did they start a new medication? Did they start a new diet that might've led to this? Have they been working more outside? Are they sweating more? Are they losing more water and not taking in what they need? Um, so main thing, fluid status and vital signs. We always want to check those, verify the patient's compensating. If they are, then we go into abdominal assessment and a rectal exam. If a patient's complaining of constipation, it's been long-term, you always want to do a rectal exam. Is there something obstructing the exit? Um, you want to check for external hemorrhoids, internal hemorrhoids, and make sure there's nothing obstructing that rectal vault because sometimes it's just as easy as getting your hemorrhoids under control. A lot of people uh, that have hemorrhoids will have issues with constipation because it hurts to pass stool. It's a smaller area to pass stool through. Uh, and especially if they have bulky stools, it just won't go through there. So we need to get the hemorrhoids under control. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, treatment for constipation. I know this sounds counterproductive, but increasing dietary fiber to a point. Um, we also, when we increase the dietary fiber, want to increase our fluid intake because if we only increase our dietary fiber, it's going to make the stool more bulky and it's going to make it easier to be constipated by blockage. So we need to increase the fluid intake as well. Um, we also need to tell the patient to exercise and perform bowel training exercises. So train their bowel when to go to the bathroom. You know, have set times when they're going to go to the bathroom and try to use it. Um, this this often works really well in younger children and in the, in the elderly. Uh, also, when we get into pharmacologic re ways to treat constipation, we think about bulking laxatives, stool softeners, all the things we can get over the counter. And typically, the patients will have tried some of these. Um, mineral oil you don't see as often anymore because it's just nasty, especially when people used to drink mineral oil. Uh, there's so many other options out there now. Typically, you're going to see people use um, polyethylene glycol or Miralax. That's going to be the number one go-to for most folks, but I really like um, Seneca S. It's a really good one because it combines some of those to relieve constipation. Uh, bristle stool scale. I always like to keep this in the office um, because this is such a subject that nobody wants to talk about. The patient doesn't want to talk about it, but we really need that information on what kind of stool are you having? Okay, you say you're constipated. What does your stool normally look like? So I'll pull this card out and just give it to them and point to which one they look like. Um, and it can kind of give you an indication that truly constipation from their diet, from whatever's going on in the process, or is it constipation from some external factor that's blocking? Um, so let's move into diarrhea now. Diarrhea, when we think diarrhea, we think sick. We think the person's got some kind of illness that is causing this as a virus? Is it something going on bacterially in their body that their body's trying to evacuate? Um, it can be acute or chronic. Some people do have chronic diarrhea with uh, some uh, clinical diagnoses, but more often we're going to see acute diarrhea. And what I like to stress to my patients is diarrhea is your body's way of trying to evacuate the offending agent. So if the patient does have a stomach virus, I'm not automatically going to put them on an antidiarrheal because that diarrhea is a way of shedding that virus and getting it out of their system. Um, so there's several, several ways that you can treat diarrhea, but typically you're going to think about things like um, Imodium. Most people like to use Imodium or Lamotil, and they work well and they're pretty well tolerated. Pepto-Bismol is another one that works really well. Um, but with my patients that, I, that take Pepto-Bismol, you always want to tell them, if you're taking Pepto-Bismol, it can cause black stools. So if the patient comes in with black stools, tell them not to be worried, it's more than likely just the Pepto-Bismol. Uh, you can also see a black tongue. So I've seen pa patients confused with having a black hairy tongue because they've been taking Pepto-Bismol, especially the tablet form now that they chew up. Um, that's a common mistake that can be made in a clinic setting. Um, Rehydration is the key with diarrhea. So just 
getting that patient to drink plenty of fluids, manage their diet, have a very bland diet, and try to let the diarrhea pass. As long as we can keep them compensating and taking in what they're putting out, they should be able to get through whatever the illness is. Now, if they're if we do a stool culture and it comes back positive for salmonella or they're running an elevated fever that's 102, 103, then I might look into more uh, something like Shigella or salmonella. But typically, it's going to be self-limiting. It'll be something that's just a common stomach virus. That's what you're going to see more often. Diverticular disease. This is uh, another common condition you're going to see most of the patients that present with this won't have any symptoms. So this is something you're gonna find um, secondary to another issue. They may be, they may say they've gained some weight, they're bloating more, they just don't feel right, their stomach's cramping more often. Um, something in their stomach just doesn't feel right. So we send them out for a CT or ultrasound, find out they have diverticular disease. So diverticulosis is that acute inflammation of those little pockets in the GI tract. and it inflames and it causes pain and it causes cramping and the, the stool can't pass properly. You can't absorb properly. Um, so typically when they have something like diverticulitis, diverticulosis, we want to increase their dietary fiber um, and put them on antispasmodics. So something like Librax, um, many of those antispasmodics can kind of calm down the cramping they're having and help that area heal and resolve the issue that may be going on. When we think of the difference between diverticulosis and diverticulitis, diverticulosis is an actual herniation of that mucosa through the through the uh, muscular layer of the colon. Diverticulitis is just inflammation of a diverticular or diverticula, and it may be due to infection. Diverticulosis obviously is the more serious because you're having the herniation of that mucosa, but typically more often you see diverticulitis, which is just inflammation or infection. So a classic presentation of a patient with diverticulitis would be that left lower quadrant pain, fever. Um, they're going to have that abdominal distension, and they can usually pinpoint it. Um, I usually don't do a rectal exam on these patients. Um, really, there's no need if it's that left lower quadrant pain and it's that recurrent colicky pain. You're going to think diverticulitis. Um, so usually, I'll send them out for an ultrasound or a CT to make sure there's no abscess. And normally, I'm going to put them on Cipro and Flagyl just to eradicate any bacteria that may be present. If they're severe um, or I think it's an issue that is past my scope of practice, I'm going to send them out to a specialist or to the hospital. It may require hospitalization if it's that, that severe. If they're not compensating, if they have a really elevated uh, fever and they just aren't handling the situation well, I may send them out to the ER. Typically, people with diverticulitis, uh, the classic patient presentation is somebody that's older than 50. They're obese, they have a sedentary lifestyle, they've used NSAIDs, and they have a low fiber diet. Inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, IBD, um, we think ulcerative colitis, and, and Crohn's. Um, Crohn's are the skip lesions, um, it's more common in northern climates and developed countries. Uh, it's lowest, the lowest rates found in the southern climate, so around this area. So you won't see Crohn's as often as you would anywhere else in the U.S. in this area. Uh, when you think ulcerative colitis, you think from the rectum up. So Crohn's would be from the upper portion of the GI tract down, and ulcerative colitis would be from the rectum up. So the lesions will occur from the rectum up. Uh, the skip lesions with Crohn's are the identifying factor of it, so they'll have to have some kind of scope to see those skip lesions. That's going to be the way it's diagnosed. But both of these patients are going to present with bleeding in the stool or blood in the stool, and they're going to have abdominal pain. They're going to have um, possible fissures and abscesses with Crohn's disease, um, whereas with ulcerative colitis, they're not going to have any abscesses or fissures or lesions. Typically with these patients, I'm going to do a CBC, but I'm only checking for anemia here. So usually I'll do an anemia panel because these patients are very likely to have be in an anemic state because of the blood loss. And often they won't know they have blood loss because it's so high up in the GI tract. And most people don't turn around and 
look at their stool after they go to the bathroom. So they won't know until they start getting the pain in the abdomen or recurrent pain after eating. Um, when you get to the barium, barium in, enema stage or colonoscopies, obviously we're gonna be sending them out for a referral and that'll be a specialty consult. And there are also some genetic testing markers that can be tested, but we typically don't do those in the office. So to treat these two conditions, when you, I mean, Crohn's really the only treatment we have for its surgery and they get a resection of the colon, depending on what area is being, um, being treated. Um, you can, there are some biologic agents that they're trying now that are working for some and budesonide is another option they have for those patients with Crohn's, but typically they're gonna end up with some form of surgery to remove that portion of bowel. Now with ulcerative colitis, you can treat these with some of the biologic agents. So like Remicade, you'll see these used a lot. You see DMARG used uh, to try to stop that ulcerative process throughout the bowel. Uh, and especially as it advances up, if it, they'll use methotrexate a lot. So these patients are being treated by specialists because we're not gonna be prescribing methotrexate in the office. Um, because it's going to be immunosuppressors or immunomodulators. We don't want to do that to our patients unless we have some kind of specialty training. You can also use oral steroids with these patients to kind of calm down flares they may have. Um, but again, these patients have a very serious condition going on. It's an immunologic condition. It needs to be managed by a specialist. And anytime they come in with a flare, even if I start on oral steroids, I'm still going to communicate with that specialist what's going on. Um, if the ulcerative colitis gets to the point that they can't be managed or slowed down um, by whatever medications we're trying, then they're going to have to have a total colectomy. IBS, um, it's just a functional GI disorder. I mean, this is something that your bowel's dysfunctional. It's not functioning appropriately or, or normally as most people's would. And to say that somebody has irritable bowel, I know a lot of people say that just as, oh, I have irritable bowel. Well, no, you're just eating foods that are causing you to go to the bathroom more often. Um, that's not irritable bowel. With irritable bowel, you have to have abdominal pain when you're, when you're using that Rome criteria. So you look back at your Rome criteria and add abdominal pain in there, then you have irritable bowel syndrome. So they're having these elongated periods of constipation and then have abdom intense abdominal pain and massive evacuation, or they're having evacuation, 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 then constipation. So you got IBSC and IBSD. There's two different forms. Uh, the management of this process most often is going to be by dietary modification. So find out what the offending agent is. So you're going to reduce the fructose content, or I mean, we're going to reduce the sugar content in their diet because that, if especially if it's the diarrheal form that increases the motility of the gas, gastric lining, and you don't want that moving as often. Uh, lacto Lactose-free diets, another one. They also have some milks that have been developed now, which are lactose-free, but they also have the enzyme A milk. It's absent of enzyme A, and it's only enzyme B, which was the offending agent, and they thought causing um, lactose issues with patients, but it was actually just an enzyme. So they have those milks they can try now and also avoiding gas reducing foods. So raw vegetables, uh, beans, anything that's going to be causing excess gas production in the body we want to tell them to avoid. We also add in antispasmodics or antidiarrheals when needed. Um, psychotropics sometimes, I don't see those as often anymore. Most people are going to handle the antispasmodic antidiarrheals and be fine, especially once they get their diet under control and whatever else is going on. If they have some genetic component or immune, immune disorder that may be leading to this. Um, also stress is a key factor in anxiety. So if we can get some of those under control, it really calms down irritable bowel syndrome. All right, we'll move into hemorrhoids now. Um, these can be external or internal. Um, Typically, these aren't going to be a presenting complaint in the clinic unless the patient's really having issues with it. Most of the time, you're going to find these on secondary evaluation. They come in for something else and say, oh, by the way, I have this too. Um, there are varying degrees of internal and external hemorrhoids, um, and there's varying degrees of treatment. Typically, 
if the patient presents and they're inflamed and bleeding and they can't go to the bathroom, then we're typically going to have to start out with some kind of medication treatment. Um, if they're not to that point and the patient's still going to the bathroom relatively normally and it's not that dysfunctional for the patient and they're not bleeding, we can usually try dietary fiber and fluid intake and try some kind of calming technique like a sits bath for that area to try to reduce the inflammation. The patient also needs to be exercising and you can try topical medications like different formulations of steroids the patient can apply to the hemorrhoids to try to reduce the size. And these are just some diagrams. This is a thrombosed hemorrhoid and this is one that you can actually treat these in the clinic. You can uh, lance these and evacuate the thrombos out of that hemorrhoid uh, and it'll relieve the patient's pain immediately. The only problem is getting through the pain to do that. So, you know, the patient has to be in a pretty severe state to get to the point of needing a thrombosed hemorrhoid evacuated. Usually when they're at that point, you can apply a topical um, numbing agent and then inject the hemorrhoid itself with some um, lidocaine as well, then lance it and evacuate the hemorrhoid with the hemostat and get rid of it for the patient. But remember, you're gonna put this patient on an antibiotic, you're gonna to have to dress it very well, and they'll have to change it two to three times a day to keep the area clean. Also, I'll tell the patients to use a sits bath twice a day, because this is, I mean, it's an open area for infection. Just like anal fissures and fistulas, same issue there. This area is an evacuation route. Everything our body doesn't want is going out, so it's high likelihood of being infected. Again, we're gonna use sits baths, um, anti-inflammatory creams like hydrocortisone, um, trimcinolone acetonide is another good one, and stool softeners. Stool, stool softeners with both anal fissures and hemorrhoids are key. So the Sinicitis is a good one um, because it's got that combo treatment if they're not able to go to the bathroom, but it softens the stool as well. And then increasing their fluid content, increasing their fiber content. Fluid content is key. When we think about fistulas, when we think fistulas, that, that's something that's surgical. We can't manage that in the clinic setting. So if the patient's presenting with a lot of mucoid drainage or uh, really pugnant drainage they're having from the rectum, then that's when we're gonna, want, we're gonna think fistula. Um, other signs that could mean they have an abscess that's led to a fistula could be fever, um, abdominal discomfort, pelvic discomfort, um, to go along with that drainage and just not feeling well in general. Uh, cancers in the GI tract, this is one that needs to be in our prevention category. So we think about cancers in the GI tract and the early identification of those possible cancers. At age 50, every patient is recommended to have a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years or a colonoscopy every 10. You can also get a virtual CT colonography now every five years, and that's acceptable as well. Um, you can also have a double barium enema every five years, and that's at age 50. So patients who have a high risk or family history of, of GI cancers, I may bump that up a little bit to say 45, depending on what that family history shows. If they've had you know, family members that have died at 48, then I want to be checking early. And most often the insurance is gonna understand that and they're gonna cover what they need. Um, but let's start off with uh, esophageal cancer. So some of the risk factors are key here. So history taking and identification are gonna be easier if we look back at some of the risk factors. So there's a smoker, um, but not only smoking, everybody runs straight to smoking. What about chewing tobacco? What, are they, what else are they taking in orally? Alcohol use, we know that's a, a high risk behavior for esophageal cancer. Asbestos exposure, that one's not gonna be as frequent now because there's so much literature on as, asbestos and it's been in the news so much with law firms looking for people with asbestos exposure and it's, it shouldn't be used anymore in anything. Uh, or nutritional deficiencies, Does the patient have nutritional deficiency, are they malnourished, are they homeless? We wanna look into those to look for esophageal uh, cancers possibly. Also, if the patient presents with any unexpected weight loss, changes in voice, uh, changing in eating habits due to problems swallowing, uh, we wanna look for that as well. Also, if they don't feel like they're satisfied when they eat or they eat just a small amount 
and they can't eat anymore, and that's a change from normal. Uh, any excessive vomiting that's not normal or not associated with any other kind of infection or abdominal bloating, we want to think about esophageal cancers. Of course, our diagnostic criteria is going to be a scope or a barium esophagram uh, that's going to be by a specialist. Typically, if I'm suspecting this in the patient, I'm going to get an ASAP appointment with a specialist to get them looked at. And then, of course, treatment is going to be surgical or oncology managed. A gastric carcinoma, these are very hard to identify, especially coming in with um, GI complaints. Most of the time it's going to be due to H. pylori infection or recurrent chronic H. pylori infections. Patients who haven't been treated properly or haven't treated their self properly uh, are going to be more at risk for this. Um, and especially those who have had recurrent ulcerations over and over throughout their life. Uh, you look at patients who have are non-compliant, who have poor body habitus, who have sedentary lifestyles. Uh, those are the ones we're going to be key to looking for gastric carcinomas. Colorectal cancer. Um, you're probably not going to see a lot of this in um, primary care practice, and they can either be symptomatic, asymptomatic. It's about fifty-fifty. Uh, presentation with colorectal cancer most times is going to be abdominal pain or rectal pain. Um, but if they're asymptomatic, I mean, this may just be a finding that we get on their, their five-year checkup, their colonoscopy. Like I said, they could have abdominal pain. They could have rectal pain. Uh, often you'll see either some form of blood loss in the stool. So it'll either be melanin or it'll be bright red. Uh, anytime they get that, they need to be checked. Uh, positive stool guaiac can be another way somebody's having recurrent abdominal pain. No obvious hemorrhoids. We can get a stool guaiac and see if there's any blood present. Especially on those that are losing weight unexpectedly, uh, don't feel like they're eating appropriately. We want to check a stool guaiac just to make sure. Of course, management of sur surgical resection only on cure. We can't get rid of this with uh, chemo. Um, typically they are going to do some surrounding chemo and radiation though just to make sure it's uh, completely eradicated and there's no other metastasis anywhere else. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Um, we'll get back to our normal schedule next week after we get done with the IPA and the quiz should be pretty encompassing of the PowerPoint but also I want you to be sure to read your text. Um, any pages that I might highlight, like 705 with that medication list, you may want to look over that and be ready for the quiz.